the Numenau, the Ding Zik, and my mind went a blank on the thing for me. Ding for a mate. <laughs> Ding Zik, so forth. A thing for me, a phenomena. Um, on page, um, oh, let's see, page 412, page 412, um, he says at the top of the second column, unless we are to move in a constant circle, we must admit that the word phenomenon indicates a relationship to something, the immediate representation of which is no doubt sensuous, but which nevertheless, uh, even without this qualification of our sensibility, must be something by itself, an object independent of our sensibility. Hence arises the concept of a noumenon. You see, thus far, he's been speaking of the way things are for us. For us, with our forms and categories. For us, through our lenses. You see. But how do we know there is such a thing as a thing in itself? No matter. Well, you know, he could say, notice the phrase, ding for a mick, it's still got the ding. <laughs> well, the, the way he puts it is, um, is this, that if what we're talking about is a way in which we are bombarded with empirical input, jumbled, confused, otherwise bewildering, and um, it is met, on the other hand, by a priori forms and categories, and what comes out is uh, some uh, thing that we can understand spatially and temporally and so forth, well, uh, there wouldn't be any content to the phenomenon unless there was a thing out there to provide you with that input. You see? The ice cube tray alone does not give you ice cube. You've got to put water in it, man. The lens alone doesn't help you see your friend's face. There's got to be something there, even though it may not be really like the way you see it through a distorting lens. You see? You've seen these distorting mirrors where you walk in and see yourself so fat and so tall and so forth. Supposing there were distorting lenses like that. For all we know, that's the way our mental lens is. So there may be something I know not what there. There must be something I know not what there. This is not Berkeley's idealism. In fact, in the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, he added a section at this juncture called the Refutation of Idealism, in which he was arguing against Berkeley. Because in the first edition, he had been accused of being a Berkeleyan idealist. We create our own world, doesn't it sound like it? No, but you create it out of the raw material that the world gives you, the real world gives you senses. So there is something there, even though we structure it in our own minds. Certainly. So he is then not an idealist, he's a phenomenalist. A phenomenalist does not deny the existence of reality in itself. A phenomenalist simply says our knowledge is confined to things as they appear to us. He's a phenomenalist. Um, there are some passages which at first reading might be confusing because he uses the word reality in two different regards. He speaks of an empirical reality, which is the way in which it's real in our own experience. Like when somebody is suffering from hallucinations, are very real to her. And the phenomena are very, very real to us. But exactly what it is out there, we don't know. Science doesn't tell us. Nor can rationalist metaphysics tell us. So the conclusion of the transcendental analytic then is about the phenomena of distinction. Now, um, let's see, one final word. Um, he speaks of the conception of noumenon as being a limiting conception and a problematic conception. It's a limiting conception because it's intended to keep our knowledge claims limited. If there is a noumenon out there that we don't know, then you're going to be modest in what you claim for what you think you do know. Okay. So that's a limiting concept. It's also a problematic concept. In the sense that while it's not contradictory, self-contradictory at all, you just cannot know what it is. It's a problem. It's problematic. That it is, okay. But what it is, however can we know? The problem is what um, a later writer calls the egocentric predicament. You can see, I can't know something without the I being involved. Now maybe we better call it a category-centric predicament here. I can't know something without the categories being involved. Okay. Well, this um, is his epistemology. Um, what comes next in the transcendental dialectic is his look at um, actual attempts to do metaphysics. So next time we'll look at some of the classic metaphysical arguments and what um, Kant thinks about them.